Hey everybody, this is your host, Gabriel Garcia, the Wandering Quill and Wandering Scribe. I am back today with another book review. Sorry that this is coming so late. Just came back from vacation, but to be honest, kind of needed one. It was nice to get away. And while I was on vacation, I had a chance of reading a special book. One that you may have already heard of. The book I'm referring to is Stormless by Nick Steidle. Now, as many as you know, I had Nick on my channel a few days ago where we discussed his book, Stormless. And I had the chance to receive an ARC copy of Stormless to read. Now, as you can tell by my, <laughs> my bookmark, I haven't finished it yet. Shocking, I know. Normally, most of these reviews I do, the book's already finished. But in this case, I'm still very early in, which means my review will be entirely genuine. Not to say my others haven't been, but because I have not yet finished this, you all get to see what I get to read. So without further ado, let us begin Stormless by Nick Steidle. But before we begin, let me tell you what the book is about. Aureus is a world of storms and chaos. Full disclaimer, I may be butchering the name, but I'm going to try to work around it. Where seven violent tempests rule the land, wreaking havoc across the, con the continent. Only the summoners, bearers of power, not unlike those of the divine tempest themselves, have the strength to stand against the tyranny of the storms. Society depends on the enigmatic summoner empowering crystals for survival. Yet when a summoner bearing powers that should not exist appears on Arvidan's doorsteps, the world begins spiraling into chaos. Hmm. Castian Vardic, a common soldier, embarked on a mission with the greatest of Aureus' summoners to uncover the truth behind the ancient summoners resurfacing. Phalian Titan Sworn, heir to one of the largest of Aureus' empires, and one of the most powerful summoners in the world unravels a conspiracy within his city. Two years in the past, Asteria Silverglade uncovers the hidden secrets of Aureus's past, discovering that there is far more to Aureus's history than he could have ever imagined. These three heroes walk the threads of fate, together weaving an epic tale of magic, war, love, and loss. Together, these individuals will forever change Aureus's future. Empires will shatter, Tempest will be unbound, but destiny will prevail as these heroes face their fated ends. This is Stormless. And without further ado, let us begin. Here is the map of Aureus. Very beautiful, very, very nice to give you an idea of the world Stormless presents. Now let's see the inhabitants of this world. Chapter 1 The Arrival Valerius Ravmoria stood in the stark yellow light of Blaze Day, staring into the dim chamber ahead. He strode into Summerglass Palace, passing through the massive white marble doors as the guards heaved them open. Valerius's Voluminous black robes whispered across the smooth white floor. He glided across the royal entry hall, making for the second set of marble doors at the far end of the atrium. Lavish furniture decorated the sides of the chamber, resting below grand marble statues of kings long past. A magnificent crystal chandelier hung in the center of the entry hall, its light staining the entire corridor. Hallways broke off to the left and right, leading to the rest of the palace. <laughs> Pairs of golden braziers lined the walls, orange flames dancing wildly within. Torches hung at intervals between them, casting feral shadows on the walls beyond. Four guards stood before the closed doors, each bearing a torch and a silver gold spear. Scorchers, the abundant sea of open flames in the room would give them an undeniable advantage should conflict arise. King Avenus Titan Swarm was known to be the most powerful scorcher. Valaris knew that much. But will it matter? He wondered. 
Valaris was not here to test the king's strength. No, Valaris had come for another reason. The guards took note of Valaris' robes and began whispering to each other at his approach. The guards stiffened as he neared, raising the spears held firmly in their armored hands. Their orange uniforms were decorated with Arvindan's insignia, a golden blazing circle of flame. Valaris' robes bore a much different look, consisting of only the darkest of blacks with slender veins of a deep blood-red cloth weaving amongst the folds and curves of the cloak. Not any closer, one of the guards called from behind a steel faceplate. Valaris stopped. The king is not currently a, currently taking appointments, the guard called. And yet, here I am, seeking an audience with him nonetheless. Valaris said, folding his hands into his robes. The king's turned back to, the guard turned back to his companions, who shrugged slightly. We are under strict orders to only let in those with a missive signed by the king's council, the guard said, straightening. We cannot grant you entry. Please be on your way. Well then, Valar sighed. That's quite a shame. I only arrived this afternoon. I was hoping that I would be given an opportunity to share the information that I have spent a pass that had been sent to pass along. The guard showed no reaction. The message I carry is intended for the king himself. Might I add, Valaris continued pacing closer, and if he should not receive it, I fear there may be consequences. <laughs> Valaris trailed off. You have been ordered to leave, the guard said, stepping forward. You will be wise to do so. <sighs> I had hoped it wouldn't come to this, Valaris sighed, grimacing. But as it happens, I will be seeing the king this afternoon, one way or another. Valaris was now only a few paces away from the lead god. You see, there is another method that I can take to grant myself entry to this throne room. Carefully, Valaris bled one of the crystals within his robes. Power seeped into his veins, infusing his body with energy. And unfortunately for you, that method involved a bit more force. He raised his hand, initiating the spell. An immaterial weight manifested in Valaris' palm. Valaris twisted his fingers, ready, readying himself. You! The guard started. Valaris didn't let him finish. He squeezed his fist, calling upon his ability to cut the blood flow from the boy's brain. I... What? <coughs> the guard started stumbling backward. The other guards shift into a defensive stance. Move. And your friend dies. Valaris said, raising his black eyes to meet those of the three other three guards. They hesitated, giving Valaris all the time he needed to take control of them. Valaris closed his other fist, bleeding several more crystals. He forced the men to the ground with a wave of his hand. They crumpled to the floor, incapacitated almost instantly. Pitiful, Valaris spat, releasing the gods a few seconds later. Valaris stopped bleeding the crystals hidden within the interior pockets of his cloak and made for the entrance before him. With a heave, he pushed open the colossal marble doors to the throne room. Dozens of marble pillars lined the chamber, a golden brazier sitting before each one. No chandelier hung in this room. In its place was a massive hanging pendant made of pure gold bearing an overpowering heath, or hearth apologies, that cast the tall ceiling in a fury of dancing shadows. Before Valage lay a long stretch of marble flooring leading to the throne at the end of the room. Guards lined the walls, each wearing the same suit of vermilion armor. Who dares venture into my throne room unannounced? Avenus bellowed, raising, rising from his royal seat. There was something to his voice, a sort of regal weight. The guards raised their spears. Orange crystals hung from their waists. Scorchers. Advisors, cloaked in the shadows of the throne, watched Velars, whisperers. They were attempting to manipulate his emotions. With a slight bleed of the crystals, Valaris shrugged off their effect. Valaris' abilities allowed him to stabilize his mind, preventing it from being affected by outside influence. Valaris Ramoria. And I might say, it is wonderful to finally meet you. Valaris smiled. Bowing, surely your men have informed you of my presence already. Your Majesty. Valaris began striding forward. A man wearing the robes of a blood sorcerer entering the city. That is certainly a piece of information that would have reached even your ears. 
The king's eyes wavered ever so slightly. I understand your apprehension in believing that one with my powers could truly be standing before you today, Balarish continued, which is precisely why I'm here now, to confirm that I am the which I claim to be. Gods! The king started. I have come bearing a warning and a threat, Valaris interrupted. He was not perhaps twenty feet from the king. The gods were no more than a few dozen yards away in any direction. Valaris would need to position himself very carefully in order for his plan to work. Guards, seize him! Get this man out of my throne room! The king commanded. Just as the guards moved to apprehend him, Valaris swung open the sides of his robe, revealing rows upon rows of blood-red crystals. The guards froze. I am a blood sorcerer, and I am one of many, Valaris said. No one dared to move as he pulled back his hood, revealing his shaved head. My sect has returned, and my master has sent me to your disgusting city with a method. message. You will surrender control of your army and your country to our organization, or will be taken from you. The king stood for a moment, as if pondering his words, then the king laughed. You come into my kingdom, into my castle. Now you command me to hand over my city, the king chuckled. You must be mad, the king slapped his knees, still bellowing with laughter. He raised his eyes back at Valaris. But if that is the game you wish to play, flames drifted from the king's crystals, swirling around his hands as he wove them together. Well, we have a special place in the dungeons for your kind. The fires licked the king's fingertips. I will not give up my armies, and I will certainly not surrender my country to you. The king guided his hands through careful, well-practiced motions, and Valaris soon found himself surrounded by brilliant dendrils of flames. Besides, even if you were a blood sorcerer, as you claim to be, my answer would be the same. Swaths of golden flames surrounded the king, giving him an almost divine aura. I've always thought the powers of your kind were a bit exaggerated. Valaris smiled, doubly bleeding his crystals. This would be a display that the king would not forget. <laughs> exaggerated? Valar snorted. Well, we'll see about that. The king lunged. Valar closed his eyes, diving into the depths of his soul. His power awaited him, begging to be unleashed. Valar grabbed hold of it, and then the blood came. The king's flames vanished as the room exploded with black-red energy. Torrents of blood flooded the chamber, scattering the contents of the throne room. Darkness surged within the air, warping the blood and causing it to levitate. A terrible power thrived, rivers of blood and darkness ravaging the chamber. Valaris knocked the guard to the ground with nothing more than a thought. The hailstorm raged, knocking down braziers, tearing apart the soft carpet, and wrecking havoc on even the pillars themselves. Dark energy smashed into the walls, causing the whole palace to quiver. A cyclone of blood magic quickened, growing stronger with each passing second. But Lara smiled. With a wave of his hand, the frenzy of horror receded slightly before him, leaving it in its place a single person. The king writhed on the marble floor before Valaris, his remain robes flapping in the raging storm of blood magic. Valaris approached him, forcing the king to his knees with a twist of his finger. You are nothing, Valaris whispered, his face mere inches from the king's. You will always be nothing. You cannot even imagine the power my people hold. Please, the king wept, trembling beneath the spikes of pain. Valaris plunged through his body. Why are you doing this? Valaris paused. Aureus is in danger, and it seems I'm the only one who can save it. You and your people have made it clear that you only respond to force. He breathed. We are your last hope. Even your most powerful summoners don't stand a chance in the face of the resurgence. Valaris released him. The cascades of blood and darkness vanished in an instant, fading into nothing. The king fell to the floor. He was mostly unharmed, as were the gods, but Valaris had no doubts that this would be a day they would not forget. You have six weeks, Valaris said. Surrender the city by then, or suffer the consequences. The king offered no response. Valaris turned, gliding toward the doors through which he had entered. As Valaris passed through the entrance, the only sound in the enormous chamber was the gentle crackling of the flames, a reminder that, to the king that, even surrounded by the very element which he controlled, he was powerless. Chapter 2 The Soldier 
Cassian and Varric took another step forward. The large chamber was quiet and empty, save for the two guards who were now stood before him. Cassian turned, finding them standing perfectly still in their orange armor. He spun back, shifting his attention to the doors in front of him. The massive white marble body and golden handle of the middle door marked it as most important. With a slight pull, it opened. Cassian stepped back, his footsteps quiet on the red carpet beneath his boots. It almost felt criminal that he was still wearing his muddy soldier shoes on the beautiful rug. But he had bigger things to worry about. It wasn't every day that someone like him was summoned to the royal palace for yet to be known reasons. He closed his eyes for a moment, sinking his breathing to his pulse. Five beats in, six beats out. Hold for three. Repeat. Both his heart rate and his respiration slowed, effectively easing his anxiety. Cassian looked up, clinging to the newfound confidence rising in his chest. The marble door finished swinging open, revealing a man wearing a hooded, dark gray robe. Whisper's robes, Cassian frowned, tilting his head. Why would they bring me here? I want to begin by easing your worries, Cassian, the whisperer said. His age was rather apparent in his raspy voice, though in a way that projected wisdom, not weakness. You are not being interrogated and you're not being punished. You have simply We have simply called you to summer glass this evening to talk. What good conversation ever starts with that? If this is about the skirmish in the Highlands, I already told you I don't know what more there is to say, Cassian said, his voice shaky. The whisperer tilted his head, seeming to smile beneath his hood. It is about that, actually. The whisperer looked up, then lowering his gaze once more. Although we have nothing more to ask you regarding how you are able to resist the whisperer's spells. The whisperer turned around, waving to Cassian as he started back into the room he had come from. Cassian hesitated, but followed. He looked around, biting goodbye bidding goodbye to the marble walls and white pillars of the waiting room. The whisperer shut the door behind Cassian, effectively trapping him in the office. A large wooden desk lay before him, complete with on one chair on each side. On the seat was leather, the other was made of wood. Cassian didn't have to ask to know which one was meant for him. He slid into the wooden chair, settling down against the uncomfortable backrest, then looked around at the rest of the room. A bookshelf covered the entirety of the back wall filled to the brim with tomes and volumes that Cassian didn't recognize. To his right was a wall decorated only with a painting of a Mistaville. It was made up mostly of random gray swirls, but so were Mistavilles, Cassian supposed. On the other side were a series of hooks and hangers, made of which were occupied by gray robes that matched the ones the Whisperer wore. The Whisperer slid into his leather chair and placed his hands on the desk lacing his fingers together. A single lamp stood to his right, the bright gray whisper crystal glowing beneath the translucent shade. Are you comfortable? the whisper asked, raising a gray eyebrow. Not really, Cassian admitted. The whisperer huffed a laugh, lowering his hood to reveal the balding remains of an aging man's hair. I assumed as much. You don't exactly seem at ease, the whisperer gave a knowing smile. Cassian raised an eyebrow. Of course, the Whisperer was referring to Cassian's emotions. The Whisperer was likely reading his thoughts at the very moment. Cassian looked to the side, letting his vision trail off. Indeed, he felt a slight fuzz at the back of his mind. I assume that if you know about the skirmish, then you know that whispering doesn't work on me, Cassian said, turning his attention back to Whisper. Remarkable, the Whisperer breathed. Who would have thought that such abilities hid behind those bright blue eyes? I have, of course, heard of the stories, but I never thought that one could truly be so resistant, especially a stormless. He added, Could you please tell me why I've been brought here tonight? Cassian asked, his voice still unsteady. I don't mean to be rude, but as I'm sure you can tell, I made quite, I made quite anxious by members of your sect. Hmm, I wish said. Now why would that be? Forgive me if I'm not too keen on having my emotions constantly read and analyzed, but I'm not too terribly fond of having someone else put thoughts in my head. Yet you can resist such inputs, correct? I... Cassian trailed off. He closed his eyes. Taking a deep breath, he found his heartbeat attuned to his mind to a steady rhythm. Opening his eyes, Cassian forced himself to speak. Listen, 
I really did like to know why I'm here, please. The whisper's brown eyes twinkled in the dim light of the room. You have made yourself quite well known amongst Arvadan's troops, the whisper stated. And it's because of the stories that we have heard that we have brought you here tonight, the whisperer extended his wrinkled hand over the table. My name is Esma, and I'll be conducting your interview. Interview? Cassian raised an eyebrow again. I'm already in Arvadan's army, aren't I? Ah, yes, but you are being considered for a special mission of sorts, you see. And my superiors would like me to conduct a few tests to see if you are quite up to the task. Could this have something to do with the commotion at the palace earlier today? Cassian turned around, still feeling the slight fuzz at the back of his mind. The door was closed, but behind, but he had no doubt that the guard stood just beyond it. It would seem that he didn't have much of a choice when it came to whether or not he wanted to continue. Am I allowed to ask what this mission pertains to? If you pass my test, then you'll be given all the information you need. I assume that. I assure you of that. However, until then... I'm afraid that I must keep those details under wraps, Esmar said, offering a warm smile. Pardon me? Cassian did not smile back. Now, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to begin by asking you a few questions, Esmar said. Of course. Esmar leaned forward, his wrinkled brow furrowed as he produced a piece of paper from the desk and began reading it. Can you tell me about the events of the skirmish that you were involved in? The one in the Highlands, Cassian asked. Esther nodded, smiling once again. Well, Cassian started. His thoughts drifted back to the cold night many months ago. The frost wall that day had ended, and the camp was beginning to settle down for the evening. No different from any other night. And then, Esther prodded, Esmar prodded, lowering the paper slightly. I began to feel something strange in the air, Cassian said, keeping his gaze forward. I quickly recognized that our squadron was being influenced by a whisperer who was trying to cast the intro off. It was like he was trying to force us to sleep. The lullaby, also known as the sleeping curse. Yes, I'm quite familiar with it, Esmar's mumbled. Please continue. I called for our captain, told him that I was worried about an ambush, Cassian said. And he told me that we had nothing to worry about, and I was imagining things. Because you would have no way of knowing if there was a whisper in the mountains that night, right? Esmar tilted his head. He is not quite hostile. No, just curious. Right, Cassian said. The others didn't feel a thing. Yet you did, Esmar said. He stared into Cassian's eyes as if searching for something. If you wouldn't mind me asking, where did you learn to not only detect but to resist the influence of whispers? I didn't, Cassian said plainly. He kept his face solid, forcing his heart rate not to forcing his heart rate to slow. I didn't learn it from anywhere. Cassian sealed himself, catching a slight change in Esmar's calm shirt. That was a lie, wasn't it? I'm not lying, Cassian said firmly. Esmar's eyes unfocused, then refocused on Cassian once again. Fascinating, he whispered. Never have I ever seen one of the stormless bear such remarkable abilities. Cassian snapped his gaze back at Esmar and glared. That was not a term he was particularly found, fond of. Now, Esmar continued, I would like to try to plant some thoughts in your head. Would that be all right? Do I have a choice? Esmar laughed again. You catch on quickly, don't you, Cassian? Esmar, with her lips, crackled into a full toothed grin. Cassian had to keep himself from rolling his eyes. He wasn't exactly in the mood for jokes. <sighs> yes, he sighed, trying his very best to keep his composure. You may do what you please. Very well. Esmar said. He lowered the paper once again, this time settling on the table. Esmar let his hands rest before him and closed his eyes. Cassian called back to his training. He closed his eyes as well, falling back into the smoke and mirrors of his mind, stealing his thoughts in preparation for the battle ahead. Can you hear me, Cassian? Yes, Cassian said, keeping his eyes closed. Ah, interesting indeed. So far as I can tell, your mind feels quite the same as others. I have infiltrated him. Take a look around if you want. I have nothing to hide. Precisely what I figured. However, I would actually prefer if you try to keep me from your thoughts. And what would that be? Cassian asked. I simply want to see if you truly are as special as I have heard. Very well then, Cassian said, keeping his eyes shut. He synced his pulse to his breathing once again. Five beats in, six beats out, hold for three, repeat, he told himself. Cassian centered his thoughts, focusing on the Synced rhythm of his respiration hobby. His thoughts melted into peace. 
into picture. He unraveled them slowly, one by one. He felt them released within his mind, his conscience coming undone as he continued focusing on his heartbeat. His breaths echoed in his thoughts, radiating through the endless caverns of emptiness. The pulse focused upon him on itself, undulating and twisting in his mind's eye. Cassian saw his shadow standing in a dark room with his hands raised above himself. He felt the beating of his heart as it swam alongside his breath. He had power. This place within himself it was like anything he would ever feel in the real world. He unwrapped his thoughts, feeling a slight pull. It was as if something was altering them, if only slightly. He held his thoughts firmly in his phantom hands, continuing to count the synced inhale and exhale of his respiration and peeling the thoughts from his conscious mind. It was working. The tension in his face faded. His body began to sag. His eyes relaxed, now hanging upon the dim room. And finally, he let go. Darkness enveloped him. The only sound was that of his own heartbeat, echoed by his timed breathing. Time passed slowly, and it wasn't until several minutes had gone that Cassian felt the pull dissipate. He peeled his eyes open, finding Esmar grinning widely across the table. Cassian smiled uncertainly, though he felt a strange sense of pride. I must admit, I'm truly astonished, Esmar tossed his hands up. You mean to tell me that you truly didn't feel a thing? Not enough to constitute any sort of response, as you have seen. Cassian smiled once again, this time the feeling of warmth and pride within his growing within him growing into full fledged excitement. Well then, Esmar said, leaning back in his leather chair, I have exhausted my trial, it seems. You passed. The king will be pleased. Esmar slipped the paper back into the desk. The king himself called for me. His heart picked up, the city drum in his mind increasing its pace, he felt the rising excitement in his veins born of adrenaline. I told you that this mission was special, didn't I? Esmar raised a gray eyebrow, his face taking on a strange seriousness. This afternoon, our king was attacked by someone who claims to be from one of the lost sects. Wait, Cassian said. There were rumors of someone posing as a blood sorcerer roaming the city this morning. It seems that person was may not have only been posing at all. Esmar said. He threatened his majesty and fled the city before we could capture him. How in Nivita's light could he have fled the city unnoticed? Don't. Don't, Esma said, raising a wrinkled hand. I know, I am confused as well, but I promise you that all your questions will be answered soon. Cassian settled into his chair, allowing his eyes to wander back to the painting of the mistral hanging on the wall. The king is sending an expedition to follow the blood sorcerer and track down where exactly he came from. Esma continued, that is all I can tell you now, for it is all I know. An expedition, Cassian asked, tilting his head. Indeed, Esma said. He has already sent Commander Nevet to pursue the blood sorcerer and keep track of his whereabouts. Tomorrow morning you are expected to report to the palace at the 8th Bell. General Surge will meet you and the others assigned to your crew there. He will be leading your mission. General Cassian gapped his heart quick and once again, General Surge, Esma laughed. Not as cold as his reputation may have you believe, though. Between you and me, he's not exactly the kindest man I've ever met, either. Cassian slid back into his seat, eyes widened. He exhaled his mind, almost rejecting it. General Surge, the guards will escort you back to your barracks. Your presence is expected tomorrow, so don't be late. Esma stood up. Cassian remained in his chair for a moment. It wasn't until Esma opened the door that Cassian came to. Well, come on then, Esma said, waving Cassian out of the door. Cassian stumbled to his feet, his legs feeling unsteady. He passed the pair of gods who had been waiting outside. The room beyond seemed smaller now, somehow. Cassian started forward, a heavy fog still smothering his thoughts. Oh, and Cassian, Esmar called. Cassian turned, meeting those soft eyes once again. Esmar tapped his head, smiling. Cassian frowned and began feeling a slight tingle in his thoughts once again. Esmar winked. Good luck. And for that, we'll end this here. Now, this is actually a really interesting book. I've never read... Um, a fantasy book like this before, especially one with a lot of magic. If I had to say one that was kind of close to this, it would be Season of the Dragon by Natalie Wright. Now, Stormless is on sale right now. It's actually Nick Steidle's very first book, and I must say, 
The first 15 pages are incredible. It definitely sets up the world and what to expect. It gives you enough, but not too much, which I really appreciate that. Very, very detailed. Very, very, very detailed. And I like that. I like stories that have detailed settings, which is very much like me. I love detailed settings. And what's really interesting is we get an idea of like the different types of sorcerers. So we've already met the blood sorcerer. We've already met whisperers who can manipulate thoughts. And we've already met scorchers, which are, some would say, fire mages. Now, if we had to classify this book as a fantasy, it would be on the realms of high fantasy. Let me go right down so you can see. And honestly, this book is really, really good. I really enjoy it. And as I said, I am still very early on in the reading process, but rereading those 15 pages again is a great read. It's easy to follow. You're not going to get lost in like the names or what's happening. So it's easy to follow, which I really enjoy. And honestly, I'm just impressed. That this is a debut novel for a young indie author. So Nick, if you ever watch this, this is great, man. I really enjoy this. And with that, my official review will be, I may give it, Four and a half out of five. Almost a five out of five. This is a really great book, and I urge you all to go and check it out. Now, I will link below where to buy it. I'll also link down below Nick Stidle's website. You can reach out to him personally. We'll also have all the social medias. And if you want to listen back to the interview, I will link that on this video below. Well, listeners, I hope you enjoyed this late night Wandering Quill book impressions review. Again, Stormless is out on Barnes & Noble and Amazon. I will link it down below. And I hope you all have enjoyed this episode. And be on the lookout for uh, this month's Historian's Lounge episode, as well as two author interviews. One with Rick Norris, author of Angelic Wars, and the other with author S.G. Blaze, author of The Last Lumenian. Those will be out next week, and I hope you enjoy those interviews, because I will have a blast interviewing them. Well, listeners, this has been the Wandering Quill and Wandering Scribe, signing out.